Hello, Journey. So good to have you today. Welcome those in the room here at Apopka. I want to welcome those at our Lake County campus. I was out at our Lake County campus uh, last uh, Sunday. Always good to see some familiar faces, but uh, always great to see some new faces that I've not met before. So it's great to be with Lake County. And I know I'm talking to people all over the world. Did you know there's a group that joins us uh, in our online community from the Bronx, New York, every week, a little watch party taking place up there? There's someone, uh, yeah, give them a hand. We also have someone in, uh, in Germany named Anne who watches us on a regular basis. And there's people all over the country and all over the world. So thank you for joining us in our online community today. Several years ago, I read about a guy who went to his doctor to get results from his annual physical. His doctor soberly said to him, I'm sorry, Bob, but I've got some bad news for you. The tests show you have a terminal disease and you really only have about six months to live. Bob let the news sink in for a moment, and he asked, Doc, is there anything I can do, any experimental drugs or treatment? There has to be something I can try. Doctor thought for a moment, and he said, there is one thing I will suggest. Move into the country, buy a pig farm, and start raising pigs. Then find a widow who has at least a half dozen kids, marry her, and bring all of them to live with you on your pig farm. And Bob looked puzzled, and he said, and that's going to help me live longer? The doctor said, no, but it'll seem like the longest six months of your life. <laughs> I think we would all say the last several months have seemed like the longest of our lives. Amen? Amen. And the next few months don't look a whole lot better. As we come into the Christmas season this year, there is as much uncertainty and unrest as there ever has been, perhaps since the very first Christmas. And yet into this dark and oppressive world, a joy was given birth unlike any the world has ever known. The joy that Jesus came to bring is from outside this world. It is the very joy that Jesus himself has in God the Father, which he has had from all eternity and will have forever. Because you see, there is no greater joy than the joy God has in God. Because God is the greatest object of joy and has the greatest capacity for joy. So as we begin this holiday series today call, that we're calling the birth of joy, here's what I want us to know. Here it is. We will never understand the true source and significance of joy in human life until we understand its centrality to the character of God. So I want to give you a little basic theology as we begin today about God and joy that John Ordberg outlines in one of my favorite books of all time titled The Life You've Always Wanted. Here's one of uh, an, an important distinctive. God is the most joyful being in the universe. Disney World may market itself as the happiest place on earth. Some have described morning talk show host Kelly Ripa as the perkiest person on earth. But God is the most joyful being in the universe. Joy is at the heart of God's plan for human beings because joy is at the heart of God himself. Nehemiah proclaims this in his book when he writes, the joy of the Lord is your strength. There is a strength in joy. It's Absence creates weakness, a weakness that leads us away from genuine joy in the Lord and to a pursuit of lesser earthly thrills and unsatisfying worldly pleasures. The psalmist declared in Psalm 1611, you have made known to me the path of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence and with eternal pleasures at your right hand. The late Christian philosopher Dallas Willard wrote about an experience he had while he was teaching in South Africa years ago. He said, a young man took me out to see the beaches near his home in Port Elizabeth. I was totally unprepared for the experience. I'd seen beaches, he says, or so I thought. But when we came over the rise where the sea and land opened up to us, I stood in stunned silence and then slowly walked toward the waves. Words cannot capture the view that confronted me. And he says, I realize God sees this all the time. He sees it, experiences it, and knows it from every possible point of view. This and billions of other scenes like it and unlike it in this and billions of other worlds. Great tidal waves of joy must constantly wash through his being. He writes, we pay a lot of money to get a tank with a few tropical fish in it. And we never tire of looking at their beauty and marvelous forms and movements. But God has seized 
full of them, which he constantly enjoys. We are enraptured by a well-done movie sequence or by a few bars from an opera or lines from a poem. We treasure our great experiences for lifetime, and we may have very few of them, but God is simply one great, inexhaustible, and eternal experience of all that is good and true and beautiful and right. And Willard concludes by saying this, all of the good and beautiful things from which we occasionally drink tiny droplets of soul exhilarating joy, God continuously experiences in all their breadth and depth and richness because God is the most joyful being in the universe. Secondly, God's intent was for creation to mirror his joy. Repeatedly we read in scripture, particularly in the Psalms and the prophets about inanimate objects praising God, such as Psalm 98, let the sea resound and everything in it, the world and all who live in it, let the rivers clap their hands, let the mountains sing together for joy, let them sing before the Lord. What can we learn about God from these poetic descriptions of seas resounding and rivers applauding and mountains singing? Well, we don't worship nature. We worship the one who created it, but nature isn't a coincidence. It's not a product of blind chance. God designed it for a reason. And even in a world that's corrupted by sin, creation performs like a giant choir composed of natural wonders that join their voices in harmonious praise, inspiring us to honor the creator. So how should we respond to creation's choir? We praise the director who conducts its performance. Let the heavens rejoice. Let the earth be glad. Let all creation rejoice before the Lord. God's intent was for creation to mirror his joy. Thirdly, Jesus came as the ultimate joy bringer. From the very beginning of his time among us, this has been true. At his birth, the angel announced, behold, I bring you good news of great joy, not small joy, not modest joy, but great joy that will be for all people. Jesus' first miracle was at one of the most joyous occasions that human beings celebrate on this earth a wedding feast. He turned water into wine and kept the party going. He promised his disciples that their faithfulness would be rewarded by a joyful celebration for all eternity. Well done, good and faithful servant. Come and share your master's happiness. Some translations say, enter your master's joy. But I believe the greatest evidence of joy being at Jesus' core was revealed in his darkest hour on the night that he was betrayed before he died on the cross. He spoke to his disciples at great length, not about what would happen to him, but about the joy his death and resurrection would bring to them. The, jo the gospel writer, John, records this. Jesus said, I've told you this, so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. Later, Jesus amplifies that statement. I tell you the truth, you will weep and mourn while the world rejoices, but your grief will turn to joy. A woman giving birth to a child has pain because her time has come. But when her baby's born, she forgets the anguish because of her joy that a child is born into this world. So with you, now is the time of your grief, but I will see you again and you will rejoice and no one will take away your joy. Until now, you've not asked anything in my name. Ask and you will receive and your joy will be complete. And then right after that, Jesus prayed this prayer. He says, I'm coming to you now, Father, but I say these things while I'm still in the world so that they, the disciples, us, may have the full measure of my joy within them. Jesus came as the ultimate joy bringer. Every new creation in Jesus Christ causes heaven to rejoice. In the gospel of Luke, Jesus tells three stories about things that are lost, a lost coin, a lost sheep, and a lost son. And he says that every time something of value that was lost is recovered by someone who loved it, some serious rejoicing takes place. Jesus said this, in the same way I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. So I want to ask you today, you want to start a party in heaven? Repent. That sounds strange, doesn't it? Now, it's true that many people repent after a party. I've heard of that. 
But the Bible tells us the kingdom of God operates just the opposite. You repent before the party starts. You see, we don't turn to Jesus to terminate the celebration. We turn to Jesus to initiate the celebration. We don't go to the party and then look for Jesus. We come to Jesus and the party finds us. You see, true spiritual celebration is the inverse of partying as the world perceives it. Partying from a worldly perspective produces the demand for more and more pleasure for personal gratification. And it always follows the law of diminishing returns so that what produced happiness in us yesterday no longer does today. Our capacity for joy actually diminishes. Celebration in Jesus is just the opposite. When we celebrate in Christ, we exercise our ability to see and feel the goodness in the simplest gifts from God. We're able to take delight today in something that we wouldn't have noticed yesterday. Our capacity for joy increases. That's why the psalmist said, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. The last part of this theology of joy I want to point out is joy is not an option in the life of a follower of Jesus Christ. Joy is essential to the Christian life. The apostle Paul wrote to believers in the ancient city of Philippi, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Joy is a command. Therefore, to be joyless is to be disobedient. But I would also say it's the most readily tolerated disobedience in the church. Not too many people get kicked out of church for being joyless. You never hear anybody say, hey, you sour push, you're sucking the joy out of here. Hit the road. But not only is joy a command for believers, it's how we're to be characterized. Bruce Larson wrote in his book, there's a lot more to your health than not being sick. He said, if joy is the surest sign of the presence of God, the bottom line for you and me is simply this, grimness is not a Christian virtue. If God really is at the center of one's life and being, joy is inevitable. If we have no joy, he writes, we've missed the heart of the good news. And our bodies, as much as our souls, will suffer the consequences. So here's the good news for you today. You can become a joyful person. you believe that? I'm going to tell you right now. You can become a joyful person. With God's help, this is possible. Now, you may be thinking, how can you say that? Some people are just more emotive. Some people are more expressive. Some people are more demonstrative than others. I'm not talking about how you express your joy. That's going to look as different as there are personalities to express it. I'm talking about the possibility of the existence of joy in your present reality, whatever your circumstances may be. As we've already said, joy is a command. And the Bible will not command us to do something we have no control over. Joyfulness is a learned skill, but listen, you must take responsibility for your joy development, not your spouse, not your parents, not your friends, not your boss. Your joy is your responsibility. In fact, I want you to repeat this with me. Everybody say it with me right now. My joy is my responsibility. Say it one more time. My joy is my responsibility. If you're sitting beside someone, don't get up and go anywhere. But if you're sitting beside someone, you know, Lake County and Apopka, even if you're sitting on the couch with someone watching online, I want you to turn to them and I want you to tell them right now, my joy is my responsibility. Go ahead and tell them right now. My joy is my responsibility. And then tell them your joy is your responsibility. Right? Now, Now, listen, some of us, may be greatly joy impaired. You may be joy challenged. You may, have, you may be experiencing a joy deficit right now, but you can do this. How can we do it? Number one, start today. Everybody say that with me right now. Start today. The first step for pursuing a life of joy is to begin right now. That's what the psalmist had in mind when he wrote, this is the day the Lord has made. I will rot. You didn't sound like very rejoicing on that one. I'm going to read it again. I'm going to give you another chance. Lake County, I hope you did better. Here we go. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice rejoice and be glad in it. He doesn't say yesterday was God's day. How happy I was then. He doesn't say tomorrow is going to be a great day. I'm just going to hang on to then. No, he says this day right now with all of its shortcomings, with all of its stresses, with all of its sorrows, this is my day to experience joy. We're all sucked into the illusion that joy will come someday when external conditions change. We go to school, 
and we think, well, we'll be happy when we graduate. We're single, and we're convinced we'll be happy when we get married. We get married. We decide we'll be happy someday when we have children. We have children. Decide we'll be happy someday when they grow up and leave the nest. I heard about three men that were arguing about when life begins. The first man said, life begins at conception. The second man said, no, life begins at birth. But the third man said, life begins when the last kid moves out and the dog dies. <laughs> and every empty nester says amen, right? This is God's day, the psalmist declares. This is the day that God has made and Jesus has redeemed. And if we're going to know joy, it's got to start today. Chuck Swindoll wrote, the habit of always putting off an experience until you can afford it or until the time is right or until you know how to do it is one of the greatest burglars of joy. Now, I know some people are asking right now, how can we know joy, Pastor, amidst all the pain and suffering in the world right now? Pastor, are you not paying attention? With all the coronavirus cases on the rise again, one and a half million deaths worldwide, global economies in chaos, and the unjust effects that all that has on the poorest of the poor. And I want to say to you, have you heard of Christmas? Do you know how dark and corrupt and broken the world was that Jesus entered? And did you understand that one of the most surprising things about joy is that it is often the people closest to suffering who have the, the most powerful and profound sense of joy. Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, spoke of his joy no less than seven times to his followers in his farewell address. Friends of Mother Teresa, the founder of the Order of Missionaries of Charity dedicated to helping the poor, have said that instead of being overwhelmed by the immense suffering all around her, she glowed with joy as she went about her ministry of mercy to the poorest of the poor in Calcutta, India. It was said of Dietrich Bonhoeffer, a German pastor imprisoned and eventually executed by the Nazis because he refused to support Hitler that Bonhoeffer always seemed to spread an atmosphere of happiness and joy over the least incident and profound gratitude for the mere fact that he was alive. It was in March of 2007. I was at a gathering of pastors in Ohio listening to a Ugandan pastor named Jackson Sinyanga. As Pastor Sinyanga talked, he told us that his father had been killed by the Ugandan dictator, Idi Amin. He was abandoned by his birth mother at three months of age. His country has been ravaged by warfare and AIDS. And yet I'll never forget what he spoke about to a group of predominantly middle-class, overindulged, distracted American pastors. He spoke, he spoke about serving God with joy. It was so convicting and so inspiring to me that a little less than a year later, I was on a plane traveling to the continent of Africa and visiting the amazing work of Pastor Senyanga in Kampala, Uganda. Listen to me, friends. True joy comes only to those who have devoted themselves to something greater than their personal happiness. The thing that most keeps me from experiencing joy is my constant preoccupation with myself. The selfish preoccupation that keeps me from pouring myself out for the joy of serving others keeps me from noticing and delighting in the countless small gifts that God offers me each day. American author George Bernard Shaw wrote these famous words. Perhaps you've heard them. Shaw wrote, this is the true joy in life, the being used for a purpose recognized by yourself as a mighty one, the being thoroughly worn out before you are thrown on the scrap heap and being a force of nature instead of a feverish, selfish little clod of ailments and grievances complaining that the world will not devote itself to making you happy. Friends, if we don't rejoice today, we probably will not rejoice at all. If we wait until the conditions are perfect, there's a good chance you're still gonna be waiting when we die. So start today. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Number two, expose yourself to joy carriers. All of us know a few joy carriers. They're good to us. They're good for us. When we're around them, they breathe life into us. They energize us. They inspire us. They make us want to be better than we currently are. I want to tell you, cherish those people. Thank them. Above all, be intentional, be intentional about being with them. 
This is important because we all have other people in our lives who are not so joyful. People who, for one reason or another, have rejected joy and have decided to be victims. And they don't want you and me to be joyful either. They're like relational black holes. And if we allow them, they'll suck the joy right out of us. One of my favorite stories is about an elderly lady who was known for her faith in Jesus and for her boldness about talking about her faith in Jesus. She would stand on her front porch and she would shout loud enough for her neighbors to hear, praise the Lord. Next to her lived an atheist who'd get so angry at her proclamations. He would often shout back, stupid woman, there's no God. Hard times set in on the elderly lady. She needed some assistance. She stood on her porch and she shouted, praise the Lord, God, I need, I need food. I'm having a hard time. Please, Lord, send me some groceries. Her atheist neighbor thought he would teach her once and for all there's no God by playing a little trick on her. So he went and he bought a large bag of groceries. He placed it on her porch. He rang her doorbell and he hid in the bushes waiting for her to come out. When the lady came out on her porch, he saw the bag of groceries. She shouted, praise the Lord. He has provided for me again. At that moment, her atheist neighbor jumped out from behind a bush and he said, aha, I got you. I told you there's no God, you silly old woman. I bought you those groceries. I put them there. God didn't provide them for you. I did. But instead of silencing his devout neighbor, she started jumping up and down and clapping her hands and said even louder, praise the Lord. You not only sent me groceries, you made the devil pay for them. <laughs> Love that. We all have a few people in our life like that neighbor, right? We all have to endure a few joy-draining people. We need to love them as best we can, but we gotta be careful not to let them shape us. We may need to limit the time we spend with them. The Proverbs writer said, smiling faces make us feel happy. Now, it's hard to see the smiling faces under the mask, right? So you gotta learn to smile with your eyes. We need to identify a few people who can play this role in our life, especially if we tend to be joy impaired. Find a joy mentor. Find someone in whom you can see the joy of the Lord really is their strength and tell them you're seeking to break free from your joy impaired condition. Begin to pray together that the Holy Spirit will produce this fruit in your life in greater abundance. Number three, celebrate the little things. Celebrate the little things. This holiday season, Eat foods you love to eat. If they're not healthy for you, don't do it often. But occasionally, you gotta have a little fudge, right? Or something with a cheesy sauce. Listen to music that moves your soul. There's so much good Christmas music. I love to hear it. Participate in a hobby that stretches and challenges you. Read books that refresh your spirit. Wear clothes that make you happy. Do you have any happy clothes? Surround yourself with beauty. And as you do these things, give thanks to God for his wonderful goodness because every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father. Reflect on what a gracious God he is to have thought of these things. And take the time to experience and savor joy and then turn your heart to God so that you can appreciate the giver more than the gifts. Nothing is too small if it produces true joy in us and causes us to turn to God in gratitude and delight. One writer said, we've learned that joy is more than a sense of the comic. It's more than earthly pleasure. And to a believer, it's more than what we call happiness. Joy is the enjoyment of God and the good things that come from the hand of God. That's why Paul wrote to Timothy, command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, but to put their hope and not, or, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God who richly provides us not with some things, not with few things, not with most things, but with everything for our enjoyment. Celebrate the little things. Fourthly, disconnect for a while. Many years ago, I read a story about a Detroit newspaper that offered 120 families $500 a piece if they would endure a month without watching television. 93 of those 120 families turned the offer down flat. The other 27 families reported their lives significantly improved during their month without television, but immediately returned to their former viewing habits as soon as they got their $500. I would say for some of us, there is no amount of money for which you would agree to go without your electronic devices for any substantial length of time, especially your smartphone. 
In one survey on cell phone usage, only 17% of those surveyed said they could go a whole day without checking their device. And frankly, I'm surprised it was that high. 88% of us regularly check our phone when we're on vacation. Some 50% of us admit to tripping over or bumping into things because you're so absorbed in your phone. Take a look at this picture. Now, here's what's striking about that picture. That's common. That's what we see taking place all the time. No wonder more than 10% of us reported missing a travel destination because we're fixated on our phone screens. A writer named Tony Rinke describes the effects of our smartphone use in his book, 12 Ways Your Phone Is Changing You. Listen to what he says. The more addicted you become to your phone, the more prone you are to depression and anxiety, and the less able you are to concentrate at work and sleep at night. He says the more distracted we are digitally, the more displaced we become spiritually. Now, you may think, what's this got to do with joy and celebration? We live in what one writer calls a culture of complaint. We're constantly being told through various media platforms that we need something newer, something bigger, something better, or something else to be happy. 24-7 connectivity assaults our senses with expertly designed stimuli that causes us to crave and consume more and more. And when we realize we can't get everything we want or we can't pay for everything we purchased, we get depressed. And you cannot be joyful when you have a basic attitude of discontent and despair. Somehow, we've got to disentangle ourselves from a society that has an ever-increasing craving for an ever-diminishing pleasure and find joy in God's presence who has eternal pleasures at his right hand. How do you do that? Well, here's a good place to start. Whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever's pure, whatever's lovely, whatever is admirable. If anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Lastly, I would say this. Keep the big picture always in mind. To a large extent, joy flows from a certain kind of thinking. Psychologists are careful to remind us that the events that happen to us are filtered through our beliefs. In other words, our beliefs help us interpret the events and determine our response to them. And I think this helps us understand the irrepressible theme of joy throughout the New Testament. The New Testament writers were engaged not so much in some form of positive thinking as they were in what has been called eschatological thinking. That's a big word, right? What does that mean? It means they viewed all the events that happen in their lives through the lens of the resurrection of Jesus and the ultimate return of the risen Christ. That's eschatological thinking. A wedding story told by author Robert Fulgham helps us understand this aspect of joy. Warning, this story is a little gross, but it makes the point. This story is about one of those over-the-top weddings that TV shows love to feature. With a central character calling the shots of this epic production that Fulgham simply refers to as the mother of the bride. This wedding included an 18-piece brass and woodwind ensemble, 24 bridesmaids, groomsmen, flower petal throwers, and ring bearers. Everything was working well and going, going according to plan until the climactic moment of the Processional and full Jim writes, Ah, the bride. She'd been dressed for hours, if not days. <laughs> no adrenaline was left in her body. Left alone with her father in the reception hall of the church while the march of the maidens went on and on, she'd walked along the tables laden with gourmet goodies and absent mindedly sampled first the little pink and yellow and green mints. And then she picked through the silver bowls of mixed nuts and ate the pecans, followed by a cheese ball or two, some black olives, a handful of glazed almonds, a little sausage with frilly toothpicks stuck in it, a couple of shrimps blanketed in bacon, and a cracker piled with liver pate. To wash this down, a glass of pink champagne. Her father gave it to her to calm her nerves. Fulgham says, what you notice as the bride stood in the doorway was not her dress, but her face. White. For what was coming down the aisle, he says, was a living grenade with a pin pulled out. And then it happened. The bride threw up. 
just as she walked by her mother. And he says, by threw up, I don't mean a polite little ladylike erp into her handkerchief. She puked. He said, there's just no nice word for it. I mean, she hosed the front of the chancel, hitting two bridesmaids, the groom, a ring bearer, and the preacher. Only two people were smiling. One was the mother of the groom, <laughs> and the other was the father of the bride. Fulgham explains that they pulled themselves together for a quieter, more private ceremony in the reception hall. Everybody cried like they're supposed to at weddings, and the groom tenderly held the bride in his arms throughout the abbreviated ceremony and even kissed her after all that. I hope she kind of rinsed her mouth out, right? But the best part of the story is 10 years later, fast forward, 10 years, everybody was invited back for another party to celebrate this disaster. And they all watched the whole thing from beginning to end because the mother of the bride hired three video cameras to catch every angle of this matrimonial train wreck. And the party was thrown by none other than the mother of the bride herself. How could all these people rejoice when everything had gone so wrong? Because in spite of all the mess, the bride still got the groom, and at the end of the day, that's all that mattered. John Ordberg asked, how is it possible to become a joyful person in a pain-filled world? Look at the promise, he says, that comes right near the very end of the Bible. Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory, for the wedding of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. Friends, heaven's groom will get his bride. The joy that is in store for God's people is so great that the only image that can do it justice is the joy between a lover and his beloved. And then we will see the wedding of which the greatest weddings on this earth have only been a dim foreshadowing. Then God will dance with his people. Then joy will reign undiminished and uninterrupted. And the joy of the Lord will be our strength forever and ever. Amen? Amen. Let's stand together right now. Let's stand. Lake County, stand with us. So, Father, we thank you that we come now. We come in joy, Jesus, that you bring to us. Joy that repenting and turning to you that brings to us in our life. Father, we thank you that, that you have not only commanded us, but you have gifted us with the Holy Spirit that we might have your joy in us. I pray, Father, we'll continue to see all the events of this world. We'll see them through the lens of a cross, of an empty tomb, and through a return of Jesus, the risen Lord. Help us to see that, Father. Thank you for this good news story, this, this birth of joy that we celebrate. And I pray that that joy will just permeate through us in this Christmas season. And we pray this in Jesus' name. We all agreed and said, amen.